mentioned earlier, we are blessed to have as a speaker today, Reverend Dr. Ray Anderson. And he is speaking on a topic that I did not bring up here with me. He is speaking on architecture, building our lives. So often we have intentions and we have uh, what's going on now, so we react, and sometimes we remember who we are and what we're all about, and that we can create our lives, we co-create with this divine flow. And sometimes we can actually stop and think, what's really possible? And how do we be that? Reverend Dr. Ray. I've been here enough. You, you already know. You know the deal. How's everyone today? Great. Much better. Thank you. So, this whole thing has yeah, spun my mind somewhere completely different now. Because, so many of you, how many of you here have never heard me speak before? Just so I get, a, get an idea. Okay, so, let me get you. So, you already know, just generally from my background, the kind of relationship I've had with my mother, right? You know, the whole abusive thing, and alcohol, and drugs, and you know, a lot of that stuff. And the theme of the month is what? Release. And I find oftentimes revisiting the, the idea of what do I need to let go? And it's funny because Every so often, Tracy and I go back to Pittsburgh and I visit my mother, and I'm not sure if it was Ram Dass who said, or someone else who said, you want to find out how enlightened you are? Spend a weekend at home. Yeah. <laughs> because your family, they know your buttons. And I go home and I visit, and it's funny that the anger that I once felt towards my mom has been replaced with compassion. And it, it, there are times when I'll, I'll speak to her and I'll feel something, and it, it's beyond words to say, I really love this woman. And I used to say, I love her, but I don't like her. That's not even true anymore. I love her. I like her. I may not like some of her decisions. How many times in our lives do we sit back enough to say or to realize or recognize how much control, how much power we actually have over our experience? You know, there are a lot of things that are going on in the world that we fuss about and we feud about and we fight about and we get fearful about. Case in point, young man shoots up several people in Texas over some art. And then ISIS makes this announcement and says, you do realize we have people scattered throughout America. And I'm hearing how many people are referencing this and literally watching them shrink in terror. Wondering why. Now, granted, on the surface, there's the idea of but but, 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 do you, do you not understand? No, no, I do, I do. I've been a victim of abuse, I've been a victim of violence. I do understand the concept. But why give them power where I am right here today? As metaphysicians, why give them power at all? The moment we hear it, why not go into that place that we know? Because whether you're a licensed practitioner or not, you do realize you're a practitioner. If you are someone who thinks, you are someone who goes to that place within and connects and identifies with source, you're practicing life, then you're a practitioner. So when you hear things on the news, or on the internet, and you go to that place of <clears throat> darkness, pain, misery, 
do you realize you're giving that more power and more energy? And is that the life that you want to create? Think for a moment, if I were to ask you, and I'm not asking you, so think this to yourself, I don't want to see any hands or anything, but I'll burst. If I ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being, oh my God, life is so delicious and beautiful and amazing, that, oh, that's 10. And 0 is, it's morning again. That's 0. On an average day, where are you on that scale? Do you jump out of bed at whatever time it is that you wake up, ready to go, ready to live life to the fullest? Or is there some element of dread, some element of, oh, why me? Why this? Why again? Why? Versus, how can I make today what I want today to be? You know, a lot of times we, we get lost in the whole, but I don't have enough money. If you say you don't have enough money, then somewhere that is saying you do not believe in the infinite power of source. <clears throat> and that on some level you see yourself as separate from source. Does my hand exist in isolation from the rest of me? No. But there are times where I may not be actively aware of my hand. There are times when we may get a smush and we become even more aware of a pain in our hand or some element of our hand. And those moments bring us conscious to, ow, 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 my hand hurts, my finger hurts, I'm in pain. But other than those moments, how aware are you of your big toe, the back of your knee, the middle of your spine? There are times when we're not aware of this that we have with us constantly. So I understand that it is easy, it is easy to sometimes lose sight of the infinite all that is. But as metaphysicians, what we're called to do is sit down Go to that place within and say, there's abundance everywhere in nature. How many grains of sand are in the Sahara? How many blades of grass are outside right now? How many breaths can you possibly take in a day? So how much oxygen is available? How many stars in the cosmos? There's abundance everywhere, except here, when we let that be our reality. If someone can go from poverty to becoming one of the richest women on the face of this planet, and you know who I'm talking about, right? The one person who, upon her inhale, She's earning approximately $4,629 million just on the inhale. Because, you know, she doesn't, she, doesn't, she doesn't work. Like, work, work, work. She's earning money when she's not working, right? So just for inhaling, she's, she's getting money. You know who I'm talking about, right? Who am I talking about? Oprah. Now, Oprah went from pretty much poverty to where her grandmother was saying, Oprah Gale, girl, you better learn how to wash these clothes. And Oprah, at approximately seven or eight, said, no, ma'am. She was four. She was four. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's even younger. It's even better. So at, at four, she says, no, ma'am. Something in her consciousness said, that's not what I'm going to do. And what did she do? Even though she was raped and abused, she still changed and transformed her life. How many of us sit back and let the outside circumstances dictate the structure of the house we are going to live in, rather than saying, this is my life. I determine what I'm going to experience. I determine what I'm going to feel. At any given moment, you can change what you feel. You, you don't believe me. 
Because I can see some of the looks on your faces, you don't believe me. Okay, so imagine for a second, I give you a piece of paper and you get a paper cut, right? And paper cuts, they, they hurt like sharp teeth. Ow, my eye! And you're going to be right there with all of your focus and intention. Oh my goodness. Right there, right? But if I drop a bowling ball on your left foot, <laughs> how quickly do you... This doesn't even become existent anymore. That quick, right? How often do you sit down to watch a television show and you're feeling the blahs, but something on television is funny and your mood shifts? It's television. It's not real. But something outside of you conspired with something inside of you made you laugh and your day changed. Why do you need Seinfeld? or Will and Grace, or Carol Burnett, to do that. Why can't you do that right here, right now, for yourself? Today's workshop, I'm going to mention this idea of spiritual architecture, and how if Chet said he wanted to build a house, he goes to an architect, and the architect draws blueprints. And from those blueprints, they go to a contractor. And the contractor knows exactly where the walls go, the height, the depth, where electricity, if they know all of it, because the blueprints are that clear. Far too many of us have been building the house of our lives based upon somebody else's blueprints. For far too long, I built and lived out my life based upon the blueprints of brothers who were older than me who did drugs who put guns to my head and demanded that I count their drug money. I lived based upon their design of my life. They determined and said, this is what you're going to do, or else. I lived based upon teachers who told me that I was stupid, that I didn't have enough artistic talent to go to move to Hollywood and to go to the Art Institute and do whatever, and I believed them. High school bullies who picked on me, who said I was weak. I lived based upon what they determined. Even when I had knee surgery the first time and the doctor said, yeah, the martial art thing, you need to stop. I allowed what they said to dictate my life. So I started limping, because that's what they said, it's gonna, that's what's going to happen, you're going to limp. I don't know why I'm limping, I don't feel like limping, but that's what they said I'm supposed to do. And then somewhere, something shifted. And I remember the lesson that my father taught me, because my father spent approximately 28 and a half years in jail, right? To serve a life sentence in jail for murder, long before I was born. And my father maintained his sanity while in jail, by playing every instrument that they offered, every sport that they offered, reading every book that the library offered, etc. So that many years later, he gets out, he's rehabilitated, he meets my mother, they get married, voila, magic happens, I'm here. And I'm watching something on television one night, and one of my favorite TV shows is getting ready to come on. Wonder Woman. Don't you dare snicker. Don't, don't, don't act shocked. You already know I'm a superhero fanatic, so don't be shocked that Wonder Woman is one. Leave me alone. So, Wonder Woman's getting ready to come on. Linda Carter. And, but, it's, but that's not the channel that's on right now. So I start to... So my father says, what are you complaining about? Get up and change the channel. Surely it cannot be that simple. <laughs> now, this is long before any of you, what you children now know, is the remote control. Wait, a long time ago in a land far away, we, the adults, used to have to get up and walk to the television and then walk away. And if it wasn't what we wanted, we had to walk back to it. It was tiring. Now, especially if the, the focus didn't come in the way we wanted it to. Oh, there it is. Okay. 
Yeah, we have to do all kind of yoga contortion stuff. Anyhow, I digress. So, get up and change the channel. That concept, that idea has been a running theme for many years, letting me know that just because that's what's on television, that's what's showing up on the screen of my life experience, I have the ability to change the channel. I don't like where I'm working, change the channel. I don't like who I spend my time, change the channel. And when you can't change, because I'm not saying I'm not in mass exodus, walking out of your job is not what I'm saying to <laughs> you. You know the saying that if you can't change your situation, change your perspective of the situation? That's changing the channel. Can you find something within that to still be grateful for? My mother beat me silly several times in my life. However, I'm grateful for everything that happened because it happened for a reason. If I were to go back and change any of the ingredients that made me who I am, it would not taste as delicious as this does. So I'm grateful. So I'm able to let go of, release all of that stuff that I no longer want to watch. And if I were to ask you, once again, I'm not as much. Think to yourself, inside voice. What in your life, on the television of your life experience, do you no longer want to watch? Is it a relationship? Is it living paycheck to paycheck? Is it lack of clarity, lack of whatever, whatever it is? Can you identify it? Because it's important to be able to identify what it is to be able to change and transform it. You know, I, lo I love, as you already know, I love language. I love it. what we do with language and how language shifts and morphs and stuff. And is it not very interesting that oftentimes we will say things like, you know, God be with you, God is, God is in you, Namaste, the God that is in me, depending on your translation, sees and recognizes and acknowledges the divine that is in you. Or we'll sing songs referencing God and us. And sometimes we get twisted and believe the words rather than the essence behind the words. Because there is no such thing as God and us. And even though I can look down and see Suzanne, and I see her at, the fact that I call her by her name, and I have my name, somewhere in me there's this idea of duality and separation. I got that, and I understand that. Thumb has its own name, so does Pinky. They even look different, but they still connect to one. So just because it looks separate, is called by another name, hand, foot. Are they not still connected to one source? One body, one God, one mind? Does it not benefit us to take more time and sit down and say, I say God, I say source. I, I use these names to refer to it. But regardless of what I call this, I'm thinking of something that I know what it is. I don't know what that is. I don't remember what it was called. I know what this is. Regardless of what you call this, for example, how many people in here are multilingual? Okay. What language? French. What is this called in French, if you know? Yeah, others? Look. Others? Cibuya. Others? Sribo. Two more. I don't have two more? Chapa. Onion. Thank oh, you. Here. Chapa. Thank you. Now, does what it's called or signed or referenced, 
change how it tastes? Does it change your experience of it? <clears throat> but we get caught up on the name far too often. And I want to argue with Lori. I, yeah, you said it's, that is not what it is. It's It's that. And she says, to you, that's what it is. For me, it's the sign I'm in. No, you're wrong. We get caught up on these labels and names so much that it's beneficial for us to sit back and say, I don't care what it's called. Can I not enjoy the flavor of it? Regardless of what you call source, can you sit back and just enjoy and be in the experience and presence of source? Don't worry about what it's called. Just enjoy being it. Not with it, just enjoy being it. Take all the labels away and start saying, based upon this, because you can't, you can't quantify inspiration, but you know you have it. You can't quantify creativity when you feel it in here. You can't quantify that, but you know you feel it. You know you feel this something in you that when I hug you, I, I feel love. You can't express that or explain it to anyone, but you know you feel it. Don't call it by a name. Feel it. And then recognize and realize that when I just, I feel love, I experience love, that I'm able to change the channel. That I'm able to say, this outer experience changes based upon my inner experience. I'm the one that has the power. Whatever's going on out there does not have the power over me. It's up to me. So rather than <coughs> complain and bemoan and grumble about what's going wrong in your life, in the world, why not spend more time saying, hello, I'm an architect and I'm reporting for duty. I'm deciding what's going to go up in my life. I'm deciding where the electricity and the wiring and the plumbing, I make up that decision. I've lived in your house far too long. It's my turn to live life on my terms. Are you ready to do that? Is the question. And it's difficult. You know it's difficult? I know. I've been there. I know. And our path because it's a spiritual practice, gets challenging. But that's why you have spiritual community. So that when I have moments and I'm... I call Jen and say, Jen, pray with me. Not pray for me, because that takes me out of the equation. <coughs> Jen, do me a favor. I don't like going to the gym. You go to the gym for me. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. That don't cost you money. <laughs> doesn't make any sense, but oftentimes, for the sake of language, that's what, can you pray for me? Pray with me. Because the mind that she is praying with is the same mind that I am connected to. So pray with me. That's what spiritual community is for. And in prayer, have the same expectation that a child has when a child goes to mom and says, Mom, can I have a new bike? And mom says, yes. The child does not go and then say, she said yes, but I don't have it yet. If mom said yes, the child trusts and immediately goes into, excuse me, mother, say that again. Did you just say yes? <sighs> I'm getting a bike. And they go and they celebrate. The bike's not here yet, but they're already celebrating. When you put something on that prayer card or talk to someone in spiritual community, the moment you say it, and you know that it is done, start celebrating. The same way a child does. That's when you create and craft the life that you want, the life that you desire, and the life that you deserve. 